So um, we're going to make a start. So can I ask everybody to take your seats so that we can um, we can begin because we're we're a little tad behind, and that's just because there's so many enthusiastic people here that we're just trying to pack you all in. Um, so if you've just come in, if you could just sit down as quick as you can so that we can um, we can make a start, that would be great. Um, so my name's Anna Harta and I'm the webcasting curator at Tate Modern. Um, I work in the interpretation and education department and also with digital programs. Um, and I'd like to uh, extend my warmest welcome to all of you uh, to this event, Wireless Cultures, which is the first event of the 2003 Public Events Programme. And it's certainly extremely encouraging that we've got such a good and uh, I am um, guessing enthusiastic audience here um, for our first event. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly introduce the event and run through a few logistics. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the chair uh, for the event, uh, which is Mitch Floor, who's sitting bes behind me. Um, I'm not going to speak for too long. Um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging a few key activities and projects which have uh, really provided some of the conceptual basis for this event. Um, and I think perhaps one of the most important of those uh, activities is the work that Tetsuo Kagawa, who will be our second speaker for the day, uh, did in Japan in the 1980s with the Mini-FM movement. Um, and certainly being aware of that uh, activity was a major inspiration behind thinking through this event. And I'm very, very proud and honoured that Tetsuo could uh, be with us today. Um, another very obvious inspiration for this event has been the very rapid growth of uh, wireless internet communities in London. Um, and I'd like to particularly acknowledge the efforts of James Stevens, who's in the audience, um, who's spoken at Tate Modern before about Consume, um, and also the other wireless groups uh, who have done such extraordinary work in London. Um, and I can see many of you here. So um, consider yourselves acknowledged. Um, and I'd also just like to um, acknowledge the efforts of Antenna Audio and the Tate Modern Interpretation team on the development of an extraordinary multimedia pilot which we piloted in the galleries last year, uh, which used a location-sensitive wireless network with PDAs. Um, and being aware of the extraordinary possibilities raised by that type of technology really spurred on the thinking behind this event. Um, Nancy will talk more in detail about that this afternoon but um, that's certainly been a, a major factor in bringing you here today. Um, just to start with a few uh, housekeeping notes as well, you can probably see that you're being filmed today. We have Claudia up the back, and we've got Geraldine on the side, and we also have Simon and Georgie um, in the webcasting booth. We're going out live on the internet, and um, an archive of this event will also appear on the website, the Tate website, after the day finishes. Um, so what that means is that when we go to the discussion periods of the day, um, which are after the first two presentations uh, in this session and the other three presentations in the last session, we'd ask you to hold off um, asking your question until you're given a microphone. Um, we're going to have uh, two roving microphones on either side of the auditorium. So um, when you raise your hand, please wait until you start speaking, until you have one in your hand, so that your questions, comments, meditations can be immortalised um, on the internet. Um, I'd also just like to note that we have got a big crowd here today, and I'm not sure whether all of you have received a copy of the programme. Um, if you haven't, we're going to have some more copies available at four o'clock when we take our tea and coffee break. So if you haven't got one, don't panic. Uh, we'll get you one. Um, for those of you who do have the programme, you'll know what the running order of today's event is. But for those who don't, I'm just going to very briefly run through it for you. Um, very shortly, I'm going to hand over to Mitch, who's going to introduce this event with a presentation which sketches the history of radio and radio art. Um, then we're going to uh, have Tetsuo Kagawa's presentation, The Phenomenology of Wireless Technologies, which is going to take place at this table and I'm sure will be a fascinating insight into the viscera of radio technology. 
Um, then we're going to call Tetsuo uh, Sean Dodson, who's a journalist from The Guardian, and Mitch to the stage for a panel discussion. And at that point, we'd really appreciate your comments, questions, and uh, input. Then we'll take a short break, have a cup of tea, recharge our batteries, and then we're going to return for the second session, which is going to concentrate on wireless internet activities. We'll kick off with a presentation from Simon Worthington. Um, Then we'll go straight into a presentation uh, by Pete Gomes. And then we'll have a short presentation by Nancy Proctor from Antenna Audio. uh, And then we will have another panel discussion. So that's the format of the day. Um, please feel free to, uh, to interject during the panel discussions. We'd really like to hear your thoughts. We're all extremely conscious that many of you in the audience know as much as we do. Um, so we'd, we'd really appreciate it that uh, you input where you can. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished chair and first speaker, uh, Mitch Floor, who's been variously described throughout the descriptions of this event as a cultural theorist, media producer, um, and critic. And I think it's fair to say that he's all three. Um, Mitch is based in Berlin. He produces the political online magazine Flauta and also works as a developer and training consultant at the Centre for Advanced Media in Prague, where he initialised the Campware software which some of you are familiar with. Um, He's been extremely active in Europe as an organiser and a producer for many years and has produced two documentaries on the topic of community radio, one, Scattered Frequencies, Radio Networking in Nepal, and another, Reaching Everyone, which was about uh, community radio in Indonesia. Um, I'm not going to speak any further because I'm sure that Mitch uh, can take us into the first session about radio most ably, so... Welcome, Mitch. Thank you. Okay, um, first thing, first question I have is actually, is there any light I can use up here, the small thing? If not, then this should be good enough. So I'll be also chairing the entire day, so I'll be also the evil guy who's going to whip everything into the time slot, and I have to whip myself first of all because we're already lo- running a little bit late. Um, to, hang on. So to start off the presentation, the first thing is that um, this was about radio and wireless technology. And I guess everybody here has the feeling that they know somehow what radio is, especially after over 100 years of the first um, transatlantic um, radio communication between Britain and America, which was actually celebrated by the BBC last year, as I guess uh, most of the radio enthusiasts in the uh, audience will know. I just thought that um, the first thing I'm going to do is, like, I call this uh, radio versus uh, wireless, which uh, might sound like something that somebody wrote up in the afternoon to have some manifesto for the, uh, for the presentation. But, in fact, we're looking at a text here from 1925, so it's quite an old text. I just want to read some extracts, because if those who have actually received the program look at the third um, page and they see the glossary of uh, wireless uh, terminologies, you can see that there seems to be um, a necessity to actually present those terminologies today related to wireless uh, Internet. And this from 1925, already was already around for some time, is an article which starts like, I see that you have installed a wireless set. I said to a well-educated neighbor of mine, no, he answers, it's a radio. I concealed the utter disgust I felt for this man and his stupidity and hurried home to write about the difference between radio and wireless. And later on it says that um, basically there is no difference between radio and wireless at the time. And uh, even though the actual scientific term electromagnetic radiation, um, which was actually termed by Heinrich Hertz when he invented the spark transmitter, led to the official term radio in 1906, there were already... At the time, still, as we see in the 20s, a lot of terms around. Something like Hertzian waves, electric waves, ether waves, spark telegraphy, space telegraphy, and wireless as well. So this article concludes with a paragraph of the author saying, to get it straight now, that the thing that you have in the living room that makes noises, like the Victrola, is not a radio, but a radio receiver or wireless receiver. The code signals, which sometimes justly drown out a political speech, should not be called wireless. Call it wireless telegraph or radio telegraph. The jazz band music you hear is not radio. It is radio telephone or wireless telephone. So you can see this was um, already 
a, a good 20 years after radio had been established, and there was still a lot of confusion over the terminology. And what I would like to do in the talk today is also not talk too much about the radio that we know today, but kind of actually leap back towards the very early days of radio, even before radio was uh, established, um, because those were times at which the idea of using the medium of radio creatively was something that was really up to anybody's vision. Because as you can see here, not only was the word a problem or the name for the medium, but um, it's also that what way to use it was also not as clearly defined. And I want you to possibly take some of those early um, quotes from, from what I'm going to talk about now or later into the wireless discussion in the afternoon because I think we are at a very similar um, stage with this technology, which is not only indicated by the, by the name. Mm -hmm. And um, going into the idea of um, using the technology creatively, the first uh, interesting thing I found is an article called Music uh, by Telegraph, which is from the 19th century. And there it's being pointed out how people are using Morse, uh, wireless Morse and cable Morse, as a means of uh, being creative with it. And I quote again from the article, We were in the Hanover Street office when there was a pause in business operations. Mr. Porter of the Boston office asked what tune we would have. We replied, Yankee Doodle. And to our surprise, he immediately complied uh, with our request. The instrument commenced drumming the notes of the tune as perfectly and uh, distinctly as a skillful drummer could have made them at the head of a regiment. So basically saying that um, people were using technology always creatively. And I think it's important when we think about radio and culture that we don't necessarily think about what's being transmitted as the kind of creative product, but looking behind the technological facade, so to speak, applying radio technology. And I think Tetsu is going to give a very exciting presentation towards that issue. And then already in the 19th century, some, they were assuming that um, there might be a way to actually transmit music with using the telegraph by saying that um, and I quote again, it is well known that the pitch of any musical note is a consequence of the rate of vibration of the string by which it's produced. Uh, whoever plays a guitar or violin knows what this refers to, or piano or anything that um, oscillates. The more rapid the vibration, the higher the note, and so on. And there it sees that by means of very simple expedients, the current may be interrupted hundreds or even thousands of times in a second, being fully reestablished in the intervals, meaning that they were trying to think of a mechanism by which they could just use the existing network for information as something that they could use to transport music. So I think this kind of level of um, probing existing technology for um, not what it was invented to do is always a very interesting um, entrance towards finding creativity and technology. And later on, we have something that just briefly wanted to hint on, is another article from 1902, which is uh, very similar to what we know about people using email or SMS messages, is that you have simple text and you need, actually, you need to find ways in which to express emotions through the electronic means you're given. And what we call, um, I think, I don't know what the English pronunciation is, but emoticons, emoticons um, these little smiley faces and so on, are capital letters, lower letters. Already in 1902, there was something similar. Uh, not only did they have their own slang in order to uh, kind of have being faster by transmitting text, but also, and I quote from this article, the mere sound of the styles of some transmitters is irresistibly comic. Um, we possibly have to keep in mind that there have always been geeks, and I've been labeled a geek myself, so the idea of irresistibly comic is a, a relative term. One of these natural humorists may be transmitting nothing more than a string of figures and still makes you chuckle at the grotesqueness of his moors. It is an everyday thing to hear senders characterized as Miss Nancy's, rattle brains, swell heads, or cranks. So basically, these people had their style of being in, uh, in the telecommunication offices. What I said earlier um, about using the existing technology for transmitting uh, sound and trying to find ways of doing this, the first um, experiment like this was done in 1906, and I guess those electronic music heads in the audience know the telharmonium as something that's being referred to as the first music synthesizer. What you see in the image 
have a little close-up. What you see in the image is just the front end, so to speak, what you would present to the business people, you may say. Uh, this is 1906. There were no real loudspeakers at the time, and uh, the telharmony, which was created by this instrument, was supposed to go all across America to hotels, restaurants, theaters, private homes, via the local telephone exchanges. So the idea was to just plug it into the wires which had been laid down and actually play this almost like a radio, and you would just pick up the phone and listen to the music. Um, the thing to develop at the time cost something like $200,000, which was a horrendous amount. And uh, it had its own telemonic hall in New York. And what you don't see there is that it was 200 tons of weight, 60 feet across, taking up a whole floor and the basement below. There are other pictures which show all the relays and whatever. Again, making a parallel to possibly the late 20th century and the investment, venture capitals, whatever, in, at the time, um, Yet, it, it, yes, it was a very creative idea of using a telephone network, but it was not a business. So the money that's been drowned in the project never came back from what it was. Um, Tadeusz Cahill, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, he was a Canadian and uh, a trained lawyer, and it's this kind of case of keep the day job. So he invested, <laughs> invested a lot of effort and money and energy, creative energy, into setting this thing up. He convinced a lot of finances, uh, you could say venture capitalists actually funded. But then as um, the story goes, um, the actual efficiency was just, and the, the way it's been picked up was just next to nil. So um, what happened apparently is that an enraged businessman burst into, broke it up, and threw the machinery into the Hudson River. So this is the myth to go along with it. That was the first bubble burst, I guess, of some major investment at the time. And I guess to actually throw 200 tons into the Hudson River is probably more exciting than having some online CD-ROM back archive to be thrown into the Thames uh, <laughs> a few years, 100 years later, actually. <clears throat> so then people were thinking, like, what is radio? So there was already uh, radio established, and they just couldn't think of what to do with it. So here we have an article from 1916, which just um, basically thought that it might be a great idea to have the president talk simultaneously to all the people. Um, and from the article it says, the idea is to link up all the largest cities and towns by radio with a powerful transcontinental government wireless station at Arlington near Washington, so that when the president makes a speech before Congress or even his inaugural address, all the people can hear it, instead of a select few gathered with an ordinary hearing distance of the speaker, as has been the case in the past. So what I found interesting is that if you look at the, um, if you look at the sketch they made, it's something that, especially those who have made sketches about where to put their wireless uh, areas in kind of neighborhood and whatever, is something that, and I'm using here uh, an image from a, a, um, a site, Microtik, um, they're based in Riga. They're selling wireless technologies. Something very similar in a way to actually make sketches of where and how to place your actual transmitters and receivers for a wireless network for uh, internet streaming or whatever. So what I found interesting is that if you look at the way in which at the time people are trying to get a feeling of what to do with the technology, and again, it's nearly 100 years onwards, you find something which is not too dissimilar. So once we have radio, I just wanted to uh, go briefly through a couple of, um, because we have a split basically, we have radio uh, for the first part of the afternoon and um, wireless technology for the second. Even though there's some overlap, I think eventually what you will hear today is a lot of uh, contemporary thinking where even radio technology and radio culture is very much influenced by uh, internet technology and ideas that come from streaming, sending, and receiving in an in internet environment. But if you look, at, uh, look back at the idea of establishing culture or an art form for radio, there are a few things I just want to bring up to basically fill the gap to today. But it's a big fast forward, and I have four minutes left. Um, first one is the art of noises. Uh, Luigi Rosolo, you see him here on the very left with instruments he developed to actually illustrate his theory. Theory was very simple to say that we had a long history of music, we had a long history of cultivating sounds, 
and um, we should possibly um, um, get rid of the entire music history that would force us to use kind of beautiful sounds as they were being agreed on and look what happens if you start making noise. Unfortunately, I don't have any, uh, anything that illustrates the sound of these um, machines, but I think the photo speaks for itself in a way. Very important was um, um, Pino Masnata and uh, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, who um, um, wrote the Futures Manifesto La Radia, which I'm going to uh, read a few parts from. But before, I just want to say that uh, Marinetti, as a futurist, had an, an earlier um, manifesto, which translate to words in freedom, where he, and I quote, he, uh, it's the idea that the elements central to the logical linguistic structure, conjunctions, adverbs, adjectives, verbal conjugations, and punctuation marks had to be eliminated to reduce language to its essential parts. So he would actually want to free language from all those issues. And the words which are now liberated, they could be juxtaposed by analogy, creating what Marinetti called a wireless imagination. So this was basically something which would mostly relate to... Um, Phonetic poetry and one of the, uh, well, Marinetti's first radio broadcast together with somebody called Fortunato de Pero was made in Milan in 1933, doing exactly that, being a collection of phonetic poetry. There's no recording from this, but um, the uh, manifesto itself would also lead later to something, uh, a work from Marinetti, which was um, called Radio Sin Sin Sintesi, sorry, and it consists of a number of small pieces, and I just want to say one that he called the drama of distances, which might also sound very familiar to people who are working with the idea of wireless connection and, let's say, what we call today kind of global village is a bit of an age, uh, kind of term that come to age, but uh, global networks. The drama of distances consisted of 12 seconds of a military march in Rome, 11, sorry, 11 seconds of a military march in Rome, 11 seconds of a tango danced in Santos, 11 seconds of a Japanese religious music played in Tokyo, 11 seconds of a lively country dance from around Varese, 11 se seconds of a boxing match in New York, 11 seconds of street noises in Milan, and 11 seconds of Neapolitan song sung in the Coca-Cabana Hotel in Rio de Janeiro. So you can see there was already a kind of understanding that we can tie these places together and make one piece of sound art or radio art from this. Um, of course, uh, cultural theorists today would indicate that there are certain stereotypes to go with the locations that he brings up, which certainly would... Um, leave a few PhD theses on a critique there. But um, just to go into the Manifesto La Radia, <clears throat> what is interesting there is that, um, and that's something that uh, Kittler brought up later on, is that where he said that um, each new medium is kind of piggybacking on our experience of old media. They were trying at the time to position radio to actually open a space where creativity could happen. And it's, it's uh, interesting to see that the first thing, it must not be. Um, must not be theater, it must not be cinema, it must not be books. So they were kind of um, wiping out all these media which already had been explored and they give some uh, longer ex uh, explanations on why those media are dead. It also abolishes time, unity of action, dramatic character and the audience, which is an interesting point when we come back later to um, the issue of sending and receiving as something that um, abolish the idea of audience and author. And then there's a number of uh, points that uh, La Radia should be, 20 points altogether, and it's, um, um, well, it's a lot of things. <laughs> it's a lot of uh, futurist things. Very briefly, uh, Rudolf Arnheim was important when he wrote in uh, 1936 Radio and Art of Sound, a publication. Um, at the time, it's important to say that by 1933, in Europe, there were already 235 radio stations and even a wireless police, which was based in Brussels, of all places. You see, Brussels also has a long tradition in regulating Europe. And, um, and this would also be a point at which you could 
run into a brief chapter on the way in which um, uh, the, the issue of police or the military have actually seized the airwaves in the First World War for the first time or even before to taking from the amateur developers taking away the airwaves and giving them another spectrum of waves where they thought they couldn't actually use much of it anyway. So they were taking the AM frequencies and they were leaving the amateur radio developers with the FM frequency range and they then developed the FM frequency technology which was different modulation of the signal. Once that worked, then the government took it away again and just went back and forth. But without actually going into a lot of military behind um, radio development, it's just a, um, it's a sad enough situation to be in right now to talk about military action, so I'll just leave this aside. <coughs> So then we have some level of um, history of uh, radio and audio culture. just want to go into uh, three classic pieces. The first one is uh, from Stockhausen Kurzwellen, which is, I just want to read out the actual setup. The setup of Kurzwellen is one piano with a shortwave receiver, one electronium with a shortwave receiver, one microphone tam-tam, with a shortwave receiver and two players, one viola and a shortwave receiver and a sound projectionist with two filters and four potentiometers. So um, Stockhausen actually did, to my astonishment, very little with radio, which is even more confusing, as most of his work or the early work is actually produced in Cologne as part of the Westdeutsche Rundfunk, uh, elekt um, the Elektronische Musikstudio, uh, the VD uh, WDR, and already in the 1950s, he was sitting there every day in the radio studio, splicing tape, making little waves, kind of changing sounds back and forth. <laughs> but despite using this as a production unit in the 50s and later in the 60s, uh, also in Japan, working with electronic music, electronic music studio in the radio, he actually hasn't really pondered much on what the radio is that supplies him as an institution with these technologies. But actually using the technology, he didn't do much with it. Funny, though, is that um, this was produced in 1968, and um, the idea of shortwave used in the performance there was very much, you could say, shaped by the time of um, the We Are All Stardust area. And um, the idea there was that shortwave is, uh, is a medium, when you receive it, it's very, um, very, uh, no, what's the level? What you hear is like crackling noises in the background. These issues is stratospheric disruptions and cosmic radiation and these issues actually coming into uh, the radio reception. So when they started the recording in 1968, it's funny that actually in the recording, the first thing you hear when they start tuning in the shortwave receiver is the BBC, um, which is everywhere. But um, <clears throat> then later on, the idea really was to find these kind of atmospheric sounds to come from the receiver and actually alter them have them play with the music. And his, uh, again referring to the, let's say, hippiesque times there, his, uh, his uh, sentence towards the piece was like, imagine finding an apple on a distant star. That which is so self-understood here is wonderfully magic there. So if you reverse this, basically that, yes, you see an apple on a distant star, that's magic there, but the idea of hearing the universe on uh, on in the actual auditorium through the shortwave is magic here. <clears throat> then we have, I have to go down again, uh, a piece by John Cage, Imaginary Landscape Number 4, which is um, for 12 radios and 24 players and a conductor. So if you have 12 radios and 24 players, anybody has a guess what the players are doing? because one of them is doing the volume and the other one is actually doing the dial to find the station. So um, it's, it's just one of these um, really great ideas, I think, that John Cage kind of really manages to condense these things down to one simple idea, and it just works. Even if you just read it, you don't even hear it. It's possibly sometimes better, though. But um, in, in 51, Cage was already influenced a lot by um, Eastern um, philosophy and started flipping coins to make decisions rather than using decisions like as uh, an author, author, so to speak. And um, this was yet another way in which he tried to find an environment which creates sound only for four minutes, that um, is actually using this level of um, accident, so to speak, to make the, the work. <clears throat> so then the last piece, 
is uh, from Arto. To have done with the judgment of God, it's called. And uh, it's, I wrote there 1947, and sometimes it says 1948. It was recorded, and Arto is better known for the theater of cruelty, which, to quote, because of its physical aspect and because it requires expression in space, the only real expression, in fact, it allows a magical means of art and speech to be practiced organically and as a whole like renewed exorcisms. I just wanted to have this run in the background. L'un de ces sales ragots, comme ils sont colportes, entre évier et latrine, à l'heure de la mise au baquet des repas, so the actual performance was never actually transmitted in radio, and it was actually censored because at the time they said there were anti-Americanisms, scatological references, sacrilegious pronouncement, and excruciating streamscapes, and which all, of course, derived from the theater of cruelty and his theory on uh, performance. Interestingly enough, this piece, like some critics said, like the reason it was actually never broadcast, not because it had all any of these things, but because it would simply scare listeners. And what's interesting in that respect is that you could look, I mean, it's this shortly after the war, and the idea of using the radio as something that you position in your living room and you receive a signal, and this is news or music, whatever it is, but you know where it comes from, you know where it is. And then in this performance, which was... Um, I just possibly have to. No, I don't need to do this. Can I turn it up a bit? It's, it's something that was just so out of nowhere that it would actually be a completely disembodied voice just coming to your living room through this radio thing. And nobody would actually be able to identify where this comes from, what it means, what the message is. And this complete lack of an origin of the performance would actually be not adequate to be transmitted at the time. Yeah, so I'll quickly go back to the uh, theory slot, because um, as you could see, um, I was pointing out some, uh, some elements of um, theory or work which were using the radio as a space to develop audio work, acoustic work. Um, play with radio as part of the work. Um, however, I think what's completely lacking out is the idea of um, the location where the radio is being received or the issue or the relation between the transmitter and the receiver. Um, and I want to refer to Robert Adrian X, who's based in Vienna, a Canadian who's been working with um, communication, telecommunication, art and telecommunication for decades. And he wrote a radio manifesto which in that relation I find interesting as here in um, point two is already saying like radio happens in the place it is heard and not in the production studio. So this is a real shift that you don't, you're not the author, you make the stuff, but basically radio is also the place where it's being heard. Um, and if we go back to what was said very early on um, about using uh, radio is something, what do we do with it? Speak and listen, transmit, do we rebroadcast the signal so the president can speak to everybody? Is there any way to actually use technology creatively to put your own um, individual profile into the transmission? Um, early on in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, Adrian X was involved in something like telephone music, where they were using telephone to actually play music to each other, to have live settings, to actually span across continents at the same time. Um, there was Vancouver, which was a mix between Vancouver and Vienna, a similar um, environment. Later on also there was something called the Horizontal Radio, which was actually, um, I think, produced by the Kunstradio, which is part of the ORF, the Public Service Broadcasting of Austria. And going back to Stockhausen, I think that the Kunstradio is currently actually conducting a lot of very interesting experiments to bring radio... Um, and internet together in a way that would actually expand the understanding of making art for this expanded um, acoustic space. The, um, yeah, and I think I'm already running far over my slot, so I just skip a little bit. I wanted to show something I can just only present very briefly which is about the politics of um, radio networking, because it's not only about the one transmitter and many receivers, but it's also 
It's also uh, about building networks where you have um, people exchanging contact with, it, with each other. And this is especially for independent small radio stations something that's increasingly interesting to use a mix of internet-based technology and radio transmission to exchange content between each other but find a way at which you can actually then deliver the content to people who don't necessarily have electricity, which you need for television, who not necessarily are actually um, able in a position that they have no literacy. I don't know what the English phrase is for that. So audio can only listen to it, and that's good enough. And uh, also in some places like uh, what Anna mentioned beginning in Nepal, which is this uh, short documentary, but also in Indonesia, for geographical reasons you have um, a complete lack of delivering newspapers from the center to somewhere in the outskirts of the country. It sometimes takes four to five days to actually get there. And if you go there with a newspaper, possibly those people can't even read. So um, there is an interest, and I just want to briefly show some... Um, description here on how they do this. In this particular case, using satellite technology to actually deliver, they, they have all these different stations who they ring up and they speak to them, they edit together new stuff, then they send this through the audio channel of a TV uplink, satellite uplink, to actually being received all over um, Indonesia. Small stations, independent stations, but Indonesia is so large, uh, covering three time zones, that there's over 350 small stations only in this one network organized. Um, the Indonesian film here is, if anybody's interested, is currently at this, uh, it's the side cinema, I think, in Newcastle. They're showing this on the 5th of March, so if there's anybody from Newcastle, can go to the side cinema and see the entire um, project. Then very briefly also about the level on which uh, radio and, um, and internet connects. It's a text-to-speech radio pro project I did for Grisdale Arts last autumn, which is basically an idea that you can post email, websites, uh, newsletters, whatever, onto one address. And then locally in Grisdale, people, uh, I would actually be listening to this in radio. So people could send me emails, and I wouldn't have to check emails. I could just listen to them. Everybody else had a radio receiver could also listen to them. And what was interesting at the time is that Matthew Campbell, who is a, a software programmer, I think he's blind himself, but he developed software for blind people, picked up on the idea, and we started this, which was also on air, uh, conversation about what to do with this. And he suggested that this might be a great way to have an automated reading service to use empty frequencies uh, throughout the night or whatever on radio stations where people could just have the internet being read out to them by just pulling the entire content and text, converting it into audio files and listening to it. And the uh, last thing, which is leading to uh, Tetsuo's um, presentation, was also um, last year, late last year in Weimar, there was a backup festival, which was a, a number of filmmakers, independent media people, sitting in something which looks like the very typical workspace scenario that I guess we all who have been vividly visiting conferences over the past five, six years have seen a lot of male people, a few female people, many computers, flip charts with things you can't possibly comprehend, people who actually draw them can't comprehend them, but there's plenty of activity going on. And one of the things we had installed there was basically a, a server where people could upload audio files and video files, and the audio files there would actually be then scheduled, so you could say every Monday play this, every Tuesday play this, between 10 and 11 o'clock. And we had built a uh, little connection. Sorry, there was one mostly here. You have a computer and the actual transmitter in the building. And then um, that was the funny thing, which leads over to Tetsuo. Ralf Hohmann, who was the uh, teaching or director of the experimental radio department at the University of Weimar, he, as I found out then, is inviting Tetsuo over once a year to actually tell the students what it's all about, as you will hear later as well. And he makes these workshops with students, and there was, uh, well, a shoebox full of radio transmitters from different years, all of which came from Tetsuo's um, uh, presentations. And what I found interesting is that the one that we actually then used to actually link up our little local internet-based radio station with on-air radio was one version by which you can see in the box here is the radio transmitter. And this is what I think is interesting to actually 
even though it doesn't say much if you look at it like this, but to actually embrace the idea of merging internet and radio, they had actually um, made the power supply for the radio transmitter to fit into something that normally has the power for the hard disk or any other machinery in the computer, meaning that the only way to actually use the radio transmitter was to actually dismantle a computer and plug it in to actually power it up. So there, the actual radio transmitter was built as part of the performance, and then the student himself decided that there would be no other way to use this transmitter for him than to use it in combination with a computer, of course, in combination also with the Internet. So even though it doesn't look like much, I think this really is uh, a new idea of having a transmitter growing into the computer and basically combining accessibility of worldwide communications through the Internet with the, the possibility to move away from your screen, move away from your computer, by using a radio transmitter to actually create a little bubble of FM transmission around your local access point, so to speak. And um, Tatsuo wrote in detail in his article towards polymorphous radio about such ideas, and I just wanted to um, possibly stop right here and get Tatsuo on stage. Where is he? and made my little notes. So um, Tatsu Kugawa, he's a radio practitioner, writer, theorist, artist, performer, you could say, and a teacher as well. He's currently professor of communication studies at the Tokyo Keiza University in the Department of Communications. And he's been working on something that's now called the Mini-FM movement since uh, the early 1980s. And I will just hand over to him now. And yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> 